One. This is a follow-up to the restaurant opening story a few weeks back, involving Kieran, the drug addled kitchen worker. The next morning, I'm up at 7 a.m. again, with the thought of the poor server who lost her life at the forefront of my mind, and remembering that I am the only one who knows. It's funny how your brain will prioritize and put in order what's important to you at any given moment. The events of yesterday wiped the tragedy from my mind until I wake up with the harsh reality of the real problem that happened the day before. Being a chef does this to me, and probably many others hearing this. It makes you ignore the real problems and prioritize the immediate issues in my little world. Over the years, I've forgotten many birthdays, weddings, and funerals because of some stupid chef taking up all of my brain power to deal with them. When I finish work in the early hours, I'm just too late to make a phone call to a loved one regarding their big event or misfortune. It's a curse I have lived with for many years now. To my family and friends, it seems that I don't care, but I do. I'm just either too tired, busy, or drunk to focus my mind on it, and I'm sorry. In the taxi to work, I plan out my day ahead, and see it as a perfectly choreographed dance of chefs in front of us working together for the end goal of good food and service. I know very well, as I have had these thoughts a lot, that it will be more of a mass slaughter of morons and overzealous egos. I arrive on site and find the same scene as any other day with the sound of techno and the smell of fresh smoked hunks of prime meat. Kieran is waiting for me like an anxious puppy, who is shut all over the carpet. I tell him to meet me in the private dining room in 15 minutes to go over the events of yesterday. I proceed to do my daily opening checks. I enter the private dining room and find Kieran massively apologetic for the events of yesterday and that he will never do it again and was truly embarrassed by his behavior. I accept it and move on. I hired this guy about a month ago and he'd been great up until the mindfuck of yesterday, so I considered it a blip or trip on his behalf. I'm sat in the office building rotas. Mike walks in and asks, I was Kieran today. Now I think he just made a fuck up, but he's okay. You know how it is, Mike. I think you better get in the kitchen, he replied. I don't mutter another word and march into the kitchen and see Kieran swaying around again. How is he wasted again? He was sober ten minutes ago. Kieran, you're fucked again, I shout. He muttered back something that wasn't really words, just a mush-up of letters he couldn't string together in his brain, like trying to explain a crazy dream you can't remember. Over the radio, I hear, Jeff, can you gather all your staff in the dining room? It's time to tell the news about the server. Fuck, I said to myself, not now. I don't think to attack the idiotic problem I have in front of me and proceed to tell everyone, including Kieran, to make their way to the meeting. We arrive in the meeting and JC proceeds to tell the staff about the server. Shock and reality is pasted all over the faces of my staff, but not Kieran. Kieran looks as if he's had a breakthrough in his crazy-eyed state. He stands up and starts to do the sign of the cross on his chest. Time slowed down for me. I can't believe what's about to happen, but I can't stop it, so I just watch in horror. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the... JC stops him dead in his tracks. Sit down, Kieran. But I think we should have a moment's silence. You know what I think? I think you should sit down and shut the fuck up. Kieran sits down and rolls his eyes back into his head. You can see a massive rush of adrenaline has just gone through him. JC marches past me and turns around to face me. I'm sick of your fucking staff. Why are you hiring these people? JC, I need ten more chefs. I pose vacancies daily and arrange trials for every service. One out of twenty might turn up, and guess what? They're getting the job. I don't give a fuck. It's a circus here. Sort it out and fire that moron now. I fired Kieran with my next breath. I told him to get changed and leave the premises. Ten minutes later, I go to check he has left and find him unable to get changed. So I have to assist him like a spoiled child that doesn't want to go to bed. I escort him out of the back door and onto the street. Outside there is an abundance of staff crying and hugging from the news they were just told. It's a sad scene, and I have to deal with Kieran instead of consoling my staff. I tell Kieran he needs to leave the street now or I will call the police. He stumbles off, waving from side to side, with his shoes on the wrong feet and his trousers on inside out. And then, bang, faceplant onto the curb. Fuck's sake, I scream. 
Everyone get back inside and let me deal with this. I roll the smoke and walk over to this steaming heap on the floor that used to resemble one of my fellow kitchen warriors, but now lies as an empty man full of disappointments. I prod him with my toe. Nope, he's just out cold and has hit his head pretty hard. Firstly, I call Mike to help, then an ambulance. Mike arrives outside with me and thinks the whole thing is brilliant. Sadly, I couldn't see the funny side at the time. All I could feel is rage for this guy. This guy who seemed determined to mess with me in my career. I notice that guests are coming and going from the restaurant and are walking past us and the unconscious baboon. I made a dramatic decision in that moment. Mike, get his legs. I'll get the top. We need to move him out of sight from guests. It does not look good. Where are we putting him? How about behind that glass bin? He said with a big old grin on his face. So there we were in the side street, both holding cigarettes between our teeth and squinting one eye to fend off the smoke, holding this unconscious man and trying to shove them behind the bin. People are walking past and I realize how screwed up this situation is. We sat him down and immediately look at each other and giggle like kids. I love my job and it's because of shit like this I will always get involved with idiotic situations. It's part of the job. Convict and drug addict's parents will never be bored. It's because I can tell these stories over and over. They never get boring. I have no regrets. Eventually, the ambulance came, checked him over, and asked those various questions. What happened then? He's fucked on something, but no idea, I reply. He tells me he can't search him. That's the police's job. So I start rooting around his bag and find a little empty baggie. I give it to the paramedic. He said it looked like PCP. Yep, PCP. I mean, I've never even seen this shit. Didn't even think it was a thing in the UK. I hear on the radio, Chef, get down to the kitchen, it's all kicking off. So I went downstairs and back into battle. It's only 2pm by this time. It's going to be a hell of a day. 2. Until yesterday I worked at a pretty good restaurant. It was an employee-first restaurant, and they really tried to care about their employees. It was a good gig, with a reasonable amount of bullshit that's to be expected of a kitchen. But overall, a good place to work. I loved my co-workers, and management was even pretty good. The servers were cool, and it was really like a family restaurant without even advertising it like that. But I fucked up one night at close, leaving the sink we thawed meat in on hot instead of cold and they had to throw out 19 pounds of Wagyu beef. A pricey fuck up, but it would be my last as they said they had to let me go after that. I had some other minor problems before that, and management at my branch wanted to overlook it, but orders came from higher up to let me go, and that's all she wrote. It was a good time, and I'm a miss it, but it's time for me to move on. It may be a bit before I work in a kitchen again, because of some circumstance and situation, but I'm always be a kitchen rat at heart. Love y'all, and I hope your closes go smooth and your opens are without a hitch. To give further details, because I'm sure some of you are wondering, I worked in a small bar with an even smaller kitchen. Our walk-in was where we kept most of the beer, so there wasn't much room for food as it is, but we did have reach-in fridges in the kitchen where we kept a lot of our food. We only had one sink in the kitchen, so we made do and we very much do not do dishes while it was being used to prep food. We also only did burgers and fries, so there wasn't very much we needed to use the sink for food anyways. The most it could be used for was straining pasta out of the mac and cheese, and we put on a burger. Weird burger, I know, but don't knock it. We're open pretty late, and the last thing we do at night, 2.30 at the earliest, 3 or 3.30 a.m. on average, is put our frozen meat in the cleaned-out dish sink under cold running tap water to thaw. Prep comes in at 7 a.m. We have no signs or evidence of rodents or other pests that would tamper with the meat. And on top of that, we only do it in the wintertime when it's consistently under 50 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Once it starts getting warmer, prep thaws meat when they come in. The quality of the beef is actually a little higher in the wintertime. During the summertime, even though the meat is more closely watched and monitored, some of the fats binding the beef together will sometimes start to melt, which makes the burger patties more prone to falling apart on the grill, and just generally less pleasant to work with. Also, 
If a tube does get punctured or ruptured, which is surprisingly rare, we toss it. The reason we thaw meat last thing at night is because we have a par amount of meat that we need prepped for each day based on traffic. We don't know how much we need for the next day until the end of the current day. I think that wraps up most of it. A knowledgeable culinary friend of mine did break down why that was bad, and if you were saying it was, well, you're right. I didn't realize how fucked up this was, but goddamn. I don't know why we haven't been shut down after doing it for years now. So, all in all, that makes me feel better about being fired from that whack-ass kitchen. It was a fun place. But maybe now I can move on to somewhere with better food handling procedures. Thanks, y'all. 3. An amazing night here in Southern California. And by amazing, I do mean we got overrun, obliterated like sleeping soldiers, attempting to repel an unexpected incoming charge at the Battle of the Psalm. We fed the entire city and got them all pleasantly inebriated. The staff, however, had one absolute banger of a time. Now on to the story. An early 60s lady and her son and daughter-in-law and their children came in to eat. There were approximately 300 people in the place at the time, and 8 people working total. Insanely busy, to put it mildly, and quite clear to anyone with a pulse that this was kind of verging on the absurd. A lot of other patrons were hands down lovely about getting drinks and food 30 minutes or so into their dining experience. I could see that we were basically packed like Wembley Stadium for Aerosmith in 95. This lady, however, let's call her the Sea Monster, as it is, however unkind, quite descriptive, from the get-go was unbelievably demanding, as though she was dining at the French Laundry. Nutty, but whatever, you know. People and all. But she was apparently insistent that her granddaughter of four years old had a severe gluten allergy but wanted to get her a burger and fries. Hmm, okay. We gave her a burger with cheese and nothing on the side, as the fries, we explained this to her, go in the same fryers as breaded appetizers, and if the allergy is severe enough, she ought to avoid the fries, etc. This creates multiple runs back and forth to the kitchen to at least pretend I'm confirming information I clearly already know, while young, bloodthirsty marines are demanding their cold brews immediately, if not sooner. I get their food out, and the little girl, poor thing, drops her burger seconds after getting it delivered to the table. <coughs> Yells the sea monster. Frick, I'm in for it, I think. I turn to check on them, and the sea monster demands I make her another burger. No sweat, I love kids, and it's way easier than debating the responsibility. So I rush back and have the cooks make another while we have 78 tickets in the window, and the machine scroll printing constantly to the floor. The cooks are pissed, as they've got to pan-cook the burger to keep it away from contamination. I'm asking that they expedite, because I don't have time for debates with the sea monster. Hell, I don't even have time to take a leak. This is madness. This is war. I'm in the trenches. Spent ammo stacks around the expo station in the form of dropped sauce cups, take out utensils, chips, and all other manner of foodstuffs. I take out the replacement burger, and the sea monster asks me for lime wedges. I rush back with the wedges while fifty or so marines snarl for beer. And lo and behold, the burger was undercooked. Game on. The sea monster swarmed towards me like a thirty-armed kraken and started, I kid you not, slam-poking me with three or four fingers directly in the nape of my neck, screaming, Now I'm gonna get really fucking pissed. Holy moly, Batman, we've got another! I think to myself as my pulse hovers around 179 beats per minute. Sweat pouring down my face and back, my shirt wet from the 19 miles or so I've run around this bar tonight. I stare at her and my vision narrows, and I can't seem to hear anything. Like I go temporarily deaf. Just a monster wildly poking me and gesticulating wildly. I come back to my senses and state firmly, but with overwhelming calm. I'm sorry, ma'am. The cooks were making every effort to keep your granddaughter alive by not contaminating her burger. They attempted to pan-cook it rapidly. For this reason, they failed. I failed you as well. And I'm sorry. She took a moment, stared at me in silent awe, and said, Well, I like you. You've been very helpful. But fuck it, I'm pissed. And then she tried to hug me or something. Not sure what the heck it was, but it was weird. And then I brought out a replacement burger, and all was okay-ish. 
But here is the absolute spell-binding kickaroo that I can't get out of my mind and why I needed to post this story. They got her to go order a fish tacos, battered, fried, and the little girl was eating them as they were packing up to leave. Amazing. <laughs> amazing, just... <sighs> amazing. Four. So I've been a server for over five years on and off. Finally moved up to bartender a few months ago. Then this trash ball of a couple comes in. Mind you, all of this happens in the span of like 20 or 30 minutes. They walk in, muse about getting a table or sitting at the bar, make a comment about not wanting to walk back to the host stand to get a table and sit at my bar. The lady is very short and has a hard time sitting in the seat and gives me a look as if I'm supposed to help her or do something about it. But as her husband is next to her and I'm behind the bar, I turn to grab some menus. I greet them with the menus and water chat about the weather and then continue running the bar. They ask for some tastes of wine and to change the channel to the game. Cool, pour them the taste and tell the host stand to change the TV. I don't have access to the iPad to do this behind the bar. They also ask for some bread, so I ask a couple of servers as well as send a ticket back to the kitchen to have it brought up. A bit later, they order a bottle off their member account. I serve it to them and take their food order, then continue on cleaning and running the bar. Well, I walk back to the dishwasher to start polishing glass, and I look up to see this guy fuming, and I ask him what's wrong. He starts with, You know, we aren't some strangers off the street. We are members. We shouldn't be treated like numbers. Note, there are three tiers of membership, of which they are the lowest. I respond with, Oh, okay, sorry, what seems to be the problem? He snarks back, Well, where's our bread? And why isn't the game on TV? It's going to be over soon, and I don't want to miss it. I apologize for the inconvenience, said that I was a bit busy and hadn't noticed they hadn't gotten their request met yet, so I'll go ask people again to assist them. He then just goes on a rant. You know, I asked you once nicely, and I shouldn't have to ask more than once. You weren't even that busy, just get it for me yourself. Note I'm the only bartender in the restaurant, and there were 12 servers on shift, all of which I had to make drinks for, not to mention, you know, other people at the bar. So I calmly tell him, I'm sorry you see it that way. Why don't I get a manager to help? Because internally I knew I wouldn't say anything professional to him. Manager walks up and he complains about the bread and TV. So she calls over the host to have them change the channel and offers to get him the bread herself. So he says he wants me to do it. And she tells him that I'm very busy right now as the only bartender in the restaurant. So it would be better if she could help him out. He goes livid and demands his food be cancelled and wants to leave. Fine by me. Manager comps his food and his wine was paid for. Bye, Mr. Man Baby. Epilogue. He goes to the wineries to get the remainder of his bottles and makes a big show of cancelling the membership and asking for the manager's name, exclaiming how he is submitting a complaint about how we were too busy for him. I'm grateful, honestly. Sorry, just had to vent about the absurdity of telling the bartender they weren't busy. Maybe he thought because I was polishing glasses it counted as nothing. Or that if I could talk and banter with co-workers while mixing drinks and pouring wine, that I wasn't doing anything. I don't know, just had to let it out. And ask would you in any situation ever tell someone who is providing a service to you that they aren't busy unless clearly not doing their job, i.e. on their phone or actively ignoring you? Like the audacity to tell the typically busiest person in a restaurant they aren't busy. Took me a moment to recover from. 5. So I, a 28-year-old female, work at a small, locally owned Dungeons & Dragons themed bar, and figured you guys would enjoy these few interactions with people who decided to come check us out today. A bit of context. My boss is great, and I love her. She hasn't worked the industry and hired a small group of us when she opened to help teach her more than what the movies show in running a restaurant. This led to us all gaining the ability to deal with Karens as if every day was purge day. Thanks, TikTok. And she backs us up if it is truly Karen behavior. So no more missed opportunities of what we wish we could have said to rude customers. And the rest of the customers love it, since most of them have been in the industry. We also have a dress code of food safe, and that's it. This is important for one guest today. Scene 1, 10 a.m. 
just opened. We were in the middle of a shopping center, so some people stop by to check us out while waiting for other places. A lady comes in while waiting for her appointment in another shop. Right off the bat, she is very hoity-toity. Even has the whole mean girl's walk with oversized sunglasses in hand. She comes straight up to me at the bar. Do you even sell wine here? We don't have very many, but I have a cup. What do you have? Well, someone is in a hurry this morning. Excuse you? You cut me off, so you must be in a hurry. I have a house red and a house white. She then asks for a very specific $30 Pinot Grigio. Nope. What kind of bar are you if you don't have a nerd bar? I smiled, watching her face turn slightly red when I cut her off in return. She then proceeded to throw the usual this is terrible customer service and I'm never coming here again nonsense as I just stood back and waved as she left. Scene two, a little before noon. We had a couple of groups in by now, all drinking and playing some form of TTRPG, tabletop role-playing games. An older guy comes in with a small child tagging along with him. The small child is fine. They were very entranced by all the cool decorations like any kid would be. We don't mind having kids in the bar, so long as they are behaved and their parents understand this is a bar. Our other guests came here to escape normal life and nerd out with friends. We aren't going to ask someone to stop cursing if it's all in good fun, just because someone brought in a child. The two sit down at a table and as I'm coming over with some waters and menus for them, the adult stands up and starts heading for the door. I stop and ask if everything's okay. He turns to me and says, This place isn't worth his time if we don't offer kids meals. We have menus posted on the door and QR codes at the tables, we also have paper ones, as I was bringing them a copy just in case. Whatever, dude. There's a McD's not far from here. Have fun, I guess. But what person expects kids' meals at a bar? We don't advertise family-friendly anywhere. Final scene for the day. A little after 4 p.m., we've got several groups from earlier still chilling and having fun, and a few more have come to hang out. Now remember I said earlier our dress code. Reason being, I wore a t-shirt with a naked anime girl on it, and shorts that show off my hentai leg piece. Judge somewhere else I love it and my artist wanted to do a big naked chick piece, so I volunteered. It's not even finished yet anyway, it's just line work, so unless you're studying it, you don't notice much, especially with how much I move around. Enter Karen. She had the hair, the walk, the purse, everything. I mean straight out of the meme, full-blown Karen. She sits at a table and just looks uncomfortable as she has to be around people. I come over with some water and a menu to say hi, and she hits me with this. Where are we? I'm genuinely confused. Uh, I give her the name of the bar, and I go on my spiel explaining the place. She then says she was confused and she thought this was such and such a city, and she didn't realize we were on a street that was infamous in the state for its sexual acts. I'm sorry, I don't understand. I have forgotten what shirt I wore at this point. Well, with what you're wearing, I'm surprised you didn't ID me when I came in the door. I raised my eyebrow at her. I mean, girls like you shouldn't be wearing disgusting things like that. And your mother must be so disappointed in you for putting that filth on your body permanently. If you were my child, I would have disowned you. So when was the last time you got to see your grandkids? Excuse you? Well, I mean... You're this much of a bitch to someone you just met, I can only hope your kids went no contact with you a while ago. And I'm betting that's where a good bit of your hatred for seeing others happy comes from. You should see a therapist. Who do you think you are? I want to talk to your manager. I'm going to have you fired. I laughed and pulled the spin everyone wants to since I'm in fact the bar manager, which only pissed her off more and made me laugh more. She left screaming that she'd have my job, and that I should be ashamed, I'm going to burn in hell, yada yada. The groups that had been here all day ordered me a couple of rounds with them for pulling that one off. I'm still waiting on a Yelp review, though. Hey everybody, Hellfraser here, and thank you very much for listening to Spinning Plates, episode 206. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Please do hit the like button if you'd be so good before you go. Thank you kindly. All right, let's see. We are uh, Saturday, I think this is. Um, I'm recording it on Sunday. Shh, don't tell anyone. Uh, okay, so uh, as the, we hopefully we'll have the usual stream tonight. 
Uh, probably a bit more forewarned, unless something else catches my attention. But for now, forewarned, uh, we will leave Phasmo in the past where it belongs for the moment. Uh, but apart from that, I think we can move on to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... Omelettes. How do you like them done? Do you like them folded, rolled, or do you like my favorite kind, just a big old omelette that's basically filled with stuff about the size of the frying pan, then you splat it onto the plate so it takes up the full plate. That's usually how I like to do my omelets. Usually with bacon and mushrooms. Maybe a little cheese if I'm feeling really decadent. In seasonings, obviously. But let me know what you think. How do you prefer to have your omelets? With that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>